80% chance of mega quake happening in the next 30 years. But what does that exactly mean? Are we putting the thoughts on hold and maybe pushing it away because it's a bit too vague to action on? My cognitive dissonance is that one moment I'm thinking about moving back to Japan and start thinking about all the great things I can do over there. Then I start thinking about natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunami, eruptions, all sorts of things, but with no specific focus. Great foods, perfectly temperature regulated bath every night, and the medical care I might need when I'm a bit older. But then really, when do these mega earthquakes hit and what exactly are the consequences? I've checked government announcements, news stories, articles, and of course, so many things getting circulated on social media. But it all gave me vague outlook and then I couldn't be sure about what to expect. I guess we will never know for 100% as we're talking about complex system of the earth, but I have finally found a super clear guidance on Japan's natural disasters and what to watch out for. I was in Japan for about three weeks and then I was reading this book by Professor Meritus of Kyoto University, Hiroki Kamata. It's called Earth Science Classes for Adults for those who live in a country of earthquakes and volcanoes, which was published this February. He's also a specially appointed professor for Kyoto University's Resilience Practice Unit, which deals with natural disasters and economic crises. He's basically written this book to educate us so that more people can survive the upcoming disasters. I am actually so thankful he's written this book. It has cleared a lot of the fog that, and questions that I had in my mind and made me feel comfortable for knowing what we're facing. And it is brutal, I have to say, but better to know this than not know it. Knowledge is power and it helps me make more informed decisions and most importantly, it helps lives. Now, um, this book was obviously published in Japanese, but I think many of you want to know the information. Foreign visitors and non-Japanese speakers are considered more vulnerable to uh, disasters due to lack of knowledge, language barrier and disaster preparedness. With the huge wave of tourism and visitors to Japan, the next natural disaster we'll have, depending on location, I think is going to be unprecedented and can be a first of its kind. While I can't possibly talk about everything that is in the book, I'll try to pick up the bits that were important to me and condense into a watchable video length with my own thoughts combined. You may be thinking about moving to Japan like me or just traveling, or maybe you are already living in Japan and thinking of your long-term plans with your dear little ones. I'll try to be as accurate as I can be, but I'm not a scientist and this is my interpretation of what was in the book. I hope this video can be a start of our own research. Three specific natural disasters we need to keep in mind in Japan. Let's start from this. So in the book, the Professor Kamata talks about three specific natural disasters we need to be paying attention to. One, Nankai Trough Megathrust Earthquake. Two, Mount Fuji Eruption. Three, Tokyo Metropolitan Earthquake. It seems like there's a disaster scenario all set out for us. Let me take you through. When we look at these three disasters along this scenario in the book, it all starts to make sense and we can begin to understand the natural order of things in the region Japan is located. The main narrative. Everything got started by the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. It was a magnitude 9.0 mega earthquake and claimed about 20,000 people's lives. It was the biggest one recorded in Japan's earthquake history and it is said to be once in 1000 years earthquake. A new era of active earthquakes unfolded as it made active fault lines in Japanese archipelago unstable, making the country more susceptible for earthquakes as a result. As you have seen and heard about big earthquakes in the last 14 years. First, we will have magnitude 9.1 Nankai Trough Megathrust Earthquake. Professor Kamata predicts this will definitely come in the 2030s. Set in 2035 as a middle point, and it could be five years before or five years after. And he claims there is no pass. It will definitely come. I think this actually makes it easier than here in probability of Nankai Trough mega quake is around 80% within the next 30 years or so. The vague guidance doesn't lead to actions of individuals. So he's trying to be as specific as possible based on various different factors, including time predictable models. What is 
Nankai Trough Mega Quake. Nankai Trough Mega Thrust Earthquake is a trench earthquake and is likely to be a combination of three different earthquakes, Tokai, Tonankai, and Nankai, happening all together or one after another, causing detrimental damage to a very wide areas of Japan, from Shizuoka all the way down to Kagoshima almost. Due to the affected areas being heavily populated, the damage is said to be 220 trillion yen, which is 10 times more than that of the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. This means Japan's half of the population will be affected by this earthquake. And if we don't do anything, total death toll is estimated to reach as many as 320,000. The areas expected to be affected by the earthquake have many factories and other important facilities. If the economic activity is paralysed, it will be the biggest crisis for the Japanese economy since the World War II. As this is a trench earthquake happens under the sea, it's expected to cause a massive tsunami as high as 34 metres in some places, and it reaches the land as fast as within three minutes in the worst hit locations, particularly Shizuoka and Kochi. He says that Nanka Traff earthquake happens about every 100 years. And once every three times, all of the three earthquakes, Tokai, Tonankai and Nankai, happen all together, causing to be a mega quake. The 1707 Hoei earthquake was the last one that had three of them, Tokai, Tonankai and Nankai happening together. And it all happened within 20 seconds. This was the largest earthquake recorded in history until the Great East Japan earthquake hit in 2011, causing severe damage throughout southern Honshu, Shikoku and Kyushu. There was another Nankai Trough earthquake back in 1854, which was just two of them. Tonankai and Nankai. Then in 1946, it happened again, Tonankai and Nankai. The scariest thing is that Tokai Jishin off the coast of Tokai area hasn't happened for a while. So the scientists think that it's accumulating energy since the earthquake back in 1854. It's a bit like you skipped your loan repayments and you need to pay a big sum in one go. It's better if the plates could release the stress bit by bit as smaller earthquakes rather than accumulate and exploding in one big earthquake. Based on this record, Nankai Trough Megathrust earthquake, which is happening in 2030s, will be a massive one, with all of the three earthquakes, Tokai, Ton Nankai, and Nankai, happening all together. Second, Mount Fuji will erupt one to two months after Nankai Trough Megaquake. Everyone knows that our Mount Fuji is actually an active volcano even though it's been fairly quiet in recent years. The mechanism of the eruption, to put it simply, is that magma chamber becomes unstable when it's shaken by enormous earthquakes, and then the water in magma turns to steam, leading Mount Fuji to erupt. These three disasters, magnitude 9.1 Nankai Trough mega quake, tsunami as high as 34 meters, an eruption of Mount Fuji are packaged up together as one. Mount Fuji was already shaken hard by Tohoku earthquakes, also known as the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. We also know that it has a crack at the top already from which some pressure could come out and cause the water in magma to turn to steam. Luckily, Mount Fuji hasn't erupted yet, but it's basically ready to go. It's been like this since 2011. Mount Fuji eruption is something to be scared about, not because of the size of the mountain actually, but the fact that it has so many side craters, which meant Mount Fuji can erupt in any direction, basically, rather than from the summit of it. And Mount Fuji is quite close to Greater Tokyo area, and it could stop Japan's vital highways and Shinkansen lines. These could cause the economic activities to basically freeze. Volcanic ash falling can only be removed by physically bagging up and removing. If it rains, it blocks the water systems as it becomes like plaster when it gets wet. Wet. and volcanic activities can sometimes last for four to five years, whereas earthquakes bring a massive damage in one go. However, it's predicted to happen after one to two months from the Nankai Trough megaquake. It doesn't happen all of a sudden like earthquakes. In addition, in Japan, there are about 20 volcanic mountains in a standby mode, just like Mount Fuji. Third, finally, Shito Chokka Jishin, Greater Tokyo Area Earthquake. 
The Great East Japan earthquake was so big that it stretched the North American plate by 5.3 meters. This is a new stress caused and another reason for new earthquakes. One of the major examples is Shutochokka Jishin, Greater Tokyo Area Earthquake with estimated magnitude of 7.3. This is due to the fact that the active fault lines all over in Japan were made unstable from the enormous earthquakes. Greater Tokyo Area has 19 active fault lines that could potentially move anytime. And this includes Kanagawa, Chiba and Saitama areas as well. Greater Tokyo Area earthquake has an epic center under the land, which makes this a land earthquake, which means it doesn't cause tsunami, unlike trench earthquakes from the sea. Needless to say though, that this will bring a massive damage due to the fact that it's a heavily populated area and it's a vital part of Japanese economy. The damage is estimated to be about 100 trillion yen, which is five times more than the Great East Japan earthquake. The important thing to remember is that we have about 2000 active fault lines in Japan and this kind of earthquake can happen pretty much anywhere in a country. So it's not just Tokyo area. Due to its estimated damage level for the purpose of disaster prevention, the government is calling this Shutochokka Jishin, Greater Tokyo Area Earthquake. It doesn't mean it's safe just because you're away from the Pacific coastline and Tokyo. You still need to check what you have around you, which I'll get to in a moment. Professor Kamata mentioned in the book that Northern Tokyo Bay earthquakes is said to bring the worst damage, with the epic center around the bottom of Sumida River and Tsukishima. As it's densely populated with old wooden houses, fire is an obvious hazard. And old buildings and infrastructure are getting old, but investment for repair work is lacking. Maybe it would have been okay 10, 20 years ago, but they may not endure strong earthquakes anymore without repair. This also applies to Nankai Trough Mega Thrust earthquake. There's so many areas of Japan that investment for maintenance and repair doesn't just reach. Maybe there aren't enough people living in the area or not enough people using the bridges and tunnels to justify the investment. Thousand year clock and hundred year clock of earthquakes. I've mentioned magnitude 9.0 Great East Japan earthquake multiple times in this video because this really changed everything by making over 2,000 active fault lines on Japanese archipelago unstable and more susceptible for earthquakes. Professor Kamata points out our situation is similar to what happened in the 9th century during the Heian period and he calls this 1,000 year clock. In 869, magnitude 9 Jogan earthquake happened, which is our magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake the Great East Japan Earthquake. The now famous Gion Festival in Kyoto began in the same year as a way of prey for the repose of the souls of those who perished in the earthquake. Nine years later, in 878, there was magnitude 7.4 Sagami Musashi earthquake, which is similar to Greater Tokyo Area earthquake. And nine years later, in 887, Magnitude 8.6 Nina earthquake and tsunami happened and caused massive damage in Osaka, Hyogo and also Kyoto area. This one is similar to our Nankai Trough megaquake. The East Japan's trench earthquake is following this 1000 year clock which activates all sorts of land earthquakes by making active fault lines unstable in the West Japan. And we also have the 100 year clock, which Nankai Trough Megaquake is following. This earthquake has three different earthquakes included and it follows the 100 year clock pretty regularly. And once every three times all three earthquakes happen together would cause a massive tsunami. And this time around, it's as high as 34 meters within three minutes in worst hit locations. And it's expected in the 2030s plus the Greater Tokyo Area Earthquake has a high chance of happening as well. But once Nankai Trough Megaquake happens and releases its energy, land earthquakes would calm down and Japan will go into a quieter period. And it goes back into the active period again. And the cycle repeats itself based on the 100 year clock. How to live in a country of earthquakes and volcanoes? We can't stop earthquakes because the heat 
in the core of the earth is moving the plate and the scale of things is way too huge to do anything about. What we can do is to research and learn so that we can be equipped with correct knowledge. Then think of the things you can do to prepare for the disasters and protect our lives and livelihood. Each of us taking mindful actions would increase the chance of survival and maintaining a life before disasters. We can apparently reduce as much as 80% of the estimated death toll if we prepare properly. This requires education and change in mindset. I think specific actions can include reinforcement of homes and making them earthquake proof, securing furniture to the walls so that they don't fall and hurt us, prepare emergency supplies, including food, medicines, emergency toilets, but most importantly, check hazard maps of your area and understand what kind of threats you have around you so you can make plans accordingly. Hazard maps. Every local area in Japan has hazard maps published by local government to help residents understand and prepare for natural disasters, including tsunami, flooding, earthquakes, landslides and volcanic eruption. With hazard maps, we can see things like estimated affected areas, evacuation routes and local shelters. We can see pretty detailed information like estimated depths of flooding, how far debris reaches from tsunami or landslides, fire risks or soil liquefaction risks on the maps. We can assess what kind of risks are around in the area and increase our awareness and improve our disaster preparedness. We can use this to plan evacuation routes. For example, it's important to decide emergency actions with your family members as each of us needs to act to protect the lives of ourselves rather than running back home to make sure everyone else evacuated before you evacuate. A lot of people died because of this in the Tohoku earthquake. We need to have everything decided and trust each other to do what's agreed because the time won't allow you to make sure everyone's evacuated in a time of emergency. It's a race against the time. I will add a link to the Japanese government's hazard map portal site in the description box below so you can find the hazard maps of your area. I think you can also access them from your local government's website if you can find them. Most of the cities should have English versions available. Earthquake Renaissance. The book actually pointed out something interesting as well, how the country's post-war economic growth and earthquake inactive period were following each other. And when the bubble burst in 1991, we started having more earthquakes kicked off by Hanjin Aoji earthquakes in Kobe in 1995. The last natural disaster peak time was during the Pacific War and one before that was end of Edo period back in 1854. Japan as a society and a country has transformed itself together with earthquakes throughout history and he calls this earthquake renaissance. We can only do what we can do to prepare so we should do our own research but it's important we keep a macro view on things so we understand that we're only living in the big nature. Within the natural cycle of things we get to enjoy the most amazing nature, water, food and onsen. 90% of Japan's national parks are coexisting with a volcanic mountain because volcanic ash enriches the soil and promotes growth of beautiful greenery in the area. And fault lines have been used as kaido, main roads connecting areas across Japan, cutting through mountains in ancient Japan. Some are now used as highways. Some of the Japanese identities were also developed throughout our history with natural disasters. A notable and practical one is the long history of mutual aid and strong sense of community developed through the history of hardships. On a more conceptual side, we have a word mujo. It means impermanence, nothing lasts forever. Everything evolves and all things will come to an end in this world. It's a Buddhist concept, but Japanese people have always had this mentality somewhere in their mind, recognizing the moment that doesn't last forever, fleeting beauty of cherry blossoms, these things are all very important part of Japanese culture. Thanks for watching. I hope it was helpful. If you're interested in more mid-brow Japanese content, please subscribe and give it ine. See you in the next video.